Rebecca and I first got married, we moved to Massachusetts so she could attend graduate school. And as you can see from the picture, we were 12 years old. Okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> but we were 22 and 23, we were really young. And because we didn't know anyone in the entire state of Massachusetts, one of our first priorities was to make some friends. Fortunately, Rebecca was in graduate school and she started getting to know people in her program. And pretty soon we had a group of four young couples who were going to get together socially and work through a book on marriage together. And it would have been great if it wasn't terrible. <laughs> well, it wasn't really terrible. It just, it wasn't really good either. There was one couple who argued a lot in front of everyone and that was really awkward and uncomfortable. There was another member of the group who when we were having our book study would just shut down and stop talking and sit there really sullenly and nobody knew why. And it, it just didn't work and eventually we had to stop meeting together. A couple of years later, we moved a couple towns over to another location and joined a new church. And at that church, we were asked to lead a small group for young couples. This, it turned out, was a real band of misfits. We had uh, people from five different countries, including a woman named Elaine from Ireland, who is still one of the most sarcastic people I've ever met. Even though it was a couples group, we had a single guy from Sri Lanka who attended the group quite often. Um, we had people with graduate degrees and high school diplomas. We had people who had money. Most of us at that point didn't have any money. Um, we argued sometimes when we would go camping. We had disagreements about whether or not it was okay to burn plastic in the campfire. It's not. There was one person in the group that I had a hard time getting along with. Two of the couples ended up getting divorced. We had our disagreements, but it ended up being one of the best experiences of community that I've ever had. This is a group of people who just truly looked out for one another. When someone had to move, which was often, it was a really expensive area and we were all kind of looking for a better place to live and a better deal. I've never seen anything like it since. We would get an entire moving truck loaded up in less than an hour, sometimes approaching half an hour. If you showed up late to help someone move, it would be done. It was really incredible the way that we took care of one another. So here's what I take away from those experiences in Massachusetts. Community can be really great. It can be beautiful. It can also be really hard. It really takes a lot of work to develop a strong community, a shared group of people living life together. And that brings us to our first chatterbox question. Have you ever tried to find community in a new place? Hello, my name's Kevin Fitton and I am the worship leader at Sycamore Creek Church's Potterville campus and also a member of the teaching team. Today we are continuing our series, Three Simple Rules, where we are looking at John Wesley's Three Simple Rules for Spiritual Health and we're applying it to different areas of our lives. Today I'm gonna to be applying John Wesley's Three Simple Rules to the idea of building community. And the reason that we're doing this is because as I've been saying, Building community is hard. It takes work. And I believe Wesley's three simple rules can help us to find and maintain community, stronger community in our churches and throughout our lives. So what are Wesley's three simple rules? The first is to do no harm. The second is to do good. And the third is to stay in love with God. Okay, the first rule is to do no harm. Now let me ask you this. Which of you have ever caused harm to someone in your church community, in a social group that you're a part of, or in your work community? I hope a lot of you are raising your hands. <laughs> I'm guessing a lot of you are raising your hands. And if you aren't, I'm wondering if maybe you're having a little bit of trouble with your memory. Because we all do this. We all cause harm. It's why it's Wesley's first rule. He's telling us, stop it. Stop hurting one another. 
But why? Why do people do this? Why do we cause harm to one another so often? Even people who really truly desire to do good and to be good in their lives. I wanna to turn together to Genesis chapter four. This is the story of Cain and Abel. Now Abel kept his flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. Why did Cain kill Abel? Abel didn't do him any harm. The issue, of course, is Cain's insecurity. He's made an offering. It's just an okay offering. While as Abel has given from the very best of his flocks, and out of his jealousy and his insecurity, he lashes out. This is something that we all do when we feel insecure. We, we seem to just want to cause harm to other people. A high school teenager sees a post on social media with all of their friends together at an event that they weren't invited to. What does the teenager do? Maybe she makes a post on social media and makes sure to leave someone else out so that they know what it feels like to have that experience. Maybe he brags about a test score when someone else next to him is struggling. A middle-aged man worries he's going to be passed over for a promotion in favor of a younger colleague. Out of frustration, he spreads a rumor about the competitor. An older woman feels ignored by her children. They just seem to have forgotten about her and her needs. Every time she talks to one of them on the phone or every time they're together, she makes sure to bring up the fact that she's lonely and that she's been disappointed and let down and it makes everyone miserable. Why do we do this? Why when we feel pain, does it make us wanna cause harm to others? Well, when we feel insecure, left out, hurt or ignored, we have an impulse to cause pain to someone else, to have them experience the same feelings that we've experienced. At least then they'll know what it feels like. Cain feels badly. He wants Abel to feel badly. Mission accomplished. There is an expression in the world of psychology, hurt people hurt people. The problem though is that hurting other people doesn't actually solve the problem or help us deal with our emotions. It only compounds the pain. So how can we respond to these experiences and these hurts in a healthier way? I have three suggestions for how we can respond to these feelings of insecurity and these hurts without perpetuating the pain that it's caused us. First of all, share your feelings of pain with someone that you can trust. This is just a different way of responding to what we're experiencing, a healthier way. Take it to a really close friend or maybe a therapist. Having those feelings recognized and validated by someone else can really help to ease that hurt and, and make us feel like we don't need to lash out at others. Second, you can respond by finding something positive to do. Now, I do wanna add a disclaimer to this, which is that if you're in a community of people where a leader is abusing power or it's just a really ugly environment, it's probably the best to just get out of there and go somewhere else. But most of the time, the issues are personality conflicts or miscommunication or misunderstanding. And instead of being a gossip and complaining to someone else about a problem that you have with someone else, a much better way of dealing with the situation is to find a positive way to contribute to your community. You can address the situation by bringing about change. Maybe you can help with communication issues by offering to put together a better platform for communication. It's amazing what you can do by responding to a negative situation with a positive response. 
it, it's really surprising. And the third healthier response is to entrust our self-worth to God. When we are, are hoping that other human beings are going to help us to feel good about ourselves and we are putting that in the hands of others, we're going to end up being disappointed and let down. But God is faithful. God is consistent with us. God believes deep in his heart that we are worthwhile. He's the one who created us. And God is so much more of a trustworthy and reliable source when it comes to finding our sense of self-worth. And it makes a huge difference if we are continually through prayer, daily going to God, looking for him to be the one to give us a sense of who we are as human beings and our value. We're choosing instead to share our feelings of insecurity with a safe person. We're doing that instead of lashing out. We're choosing in the context of a, a community of people to do good, to help find solutions where there are problems with personality conflicts and communication. We're, we're experiencing and expressing positive leadership instead of trying to make things worse. And instead of looking to others for our sense of self-worth, we're choosing to entrust that to God. Which brings us to our next discussion question. Which of these three ways that we can use to stop perpetuating harm are you most attracted to? The second of Wesley's rules is to do good in order to help build community. And I want to make this really simple because it is really simple. In order to do good to build community, the key is that we need to help and ask for help. That's the key, to help and ask for help. It has to be both. Either or doesn't work. One side of this coin is pretty easy to understand. If a person is always asking for help and taking help if they need, need, want, want, but they're never responding to other people's needs, that's an unbalanced approach to community. Now, of course, there are going to be times in our lives when we need more help. We've gone through a divorce or a job loss or experiencing you know, physical issues or, or a long-standing illness. And there are going to be seasons in our life when we're going to be receiving a lot more help than we're going to be able to offer to others. But of course, over time, it's really important that we are responding to other people's needs even as we're going through our own struggles. That's a part of being in community. The other side of the coin is an issue as well though. If we are only offering help and never receiving help, we're not fully participating in community. You know, on the surface, this might seem like a really good thing when a person is giving help and giving help and they're never receiving. But the thing is, everyone has needs. And if we're not willing to accept help from others, then we're rejecting community. We're saying to other people, I don't need you. And that's just as detrimental to community as the person who's always taking, the person who will never be willing to receive. Think about it this way. In nature, there are three ways in which species relate to one another. One of those ways is a parasitic relationship where one species is taking advantage of another species. That species thrives while the other's suffering and dying for the sake of the, of the species that's thriving. Then we have commensalism. And in commensalism, you have one species who is, is gaining from the relationship and another that's in a neutral stance. And then finally, we have mutualism. Mutualism is when two different species and all these organisms are participating in community. They're all gaining from the relationship. Now, what do we want our communities to be like of those three modes of relating to one another as species? We want to experience mutualism, right? <laughs> and the only way that we can experience mutualism is if everyone is participating in that by helping and receiving help. Okay, so the key to doing good in community is to both help and receive help. 
It's really important that we are contributing to our community, that we're giving financially, that we're investing in relationships with other people in the community, and not just our best friends, that we're greeting guests and we're taking time to get to know people who are new to the community or who maybe haven't been reached out to by others. And it's also really vital that we're people who are receiving help, who are willing to be vulnerable enough to take part in community in that way where we are giving and we are also accepting that support and help from others. In community, we learn to let down our guard. And that brings us to our third Chatterbox question. Is it easier for you to be someone who is giving or receiving help? Finally, the third simple rule is stay in love with God. So how do we stay in love with God in community? Well, the key is that we do it in community. Even though community can be hard, even though some people burn plastic in the campfire or shut down awkwardly during a small group discussion, even though we hurt and get hurt in the context of community, being in community is a key to staying in love with God. In our society, one common approach to faith is to say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. You've probably heard someone say this. Maybe you've said this yourself. It's like saying me and God were good. And maybe part of that is because of politics and the history of the church and some of the other stuff that has to do with organized religion. But I also think a lot of what we're saying is that we want to have a spirituality that's personal because it's safer, because community is hard, because people are hard, and we just don't want to deal with it. Listen, I've had times in my life where I felt that way too, where I felt like I was pretty much done with church. But here's the reality. I honestly don't know how any person can successfully pursue God and stay in love with God outside of the context of community. I don't know how we can accomplish anything significant in our lives on our own. My primary vocation at this point in my life is as a writer. And I know that we have a stereotype about writers that it's this very solitary endeavor, you know, that the writer heads off into a cabin in the woods and then they come out with this book. And certainly there are aspects of writing that are solitary. There are parts of it that we do on our own. But I can tell you that I have a book coming out this fall, and I recently wrote the acknowledgments page for my book. And it was amazing to, to realize as I was writing down the names of every person who helped me with this book that there were 20 people who had a direct impact on the work that I did, offering feedback and help and support in very practical ways so that this solitary work of writing could come together. It's a big project, and the truth is that it requires community. This is true of all the writers that I know. They have people around them who help them and support them in so many ways. Even in this very solitary art form, I don't know a single person who does that work on their own. And this is true even more so in the pursuit of following and staying in love with God. In the book of Hebrews, the writer makes this plea to people of faith. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Notice how the writer makes this plea to stay in love with God, and then immediately follows that with a plea to stay in community, to not give up meeting together, to stick in there, even though sometimes it's hard. It's because it's vital that we have people around us, a community of people who will help us to stay in love with God. We have two teenage girls in our family, and I can tell you that being a teenager in the 2020s is hard. 
<laughs> it's really challenging for our girls as they navigate the hallways of their schools and the pathways of friendship. We have a lot of young people over at our house and we even took a group of six teenage girls to Florida with us for spring break this year, which was a little crazy. <laughs> but one of the things that I often think about is what a huge advantage our kids have over some of their friends who don't have the experience of being in Christian community. And I've reflected on this a lot, especially since we came back from that trip. Through our church, they have friends with whom they share a lot of values, and they always have those relationships to fall back on. They also have this experience of gathering every week to talk about life and faith and relationship and how we can live lives that are full of vibrancy and life instead of darkness and despair. And I often wonder how hard it must be for some of the kids who don't have this experience of community, who don't have the kind of support that, that our teenagers do. We need it so badly. We need that kind of encouragement and care that we get in a church like ours. We need the wisdom for life that we find in the scriptures. And we need community that will help us to stay in love with God. I wanna to end today with a plea. If you're a person who has this kind of community, I encourage you to stay in it and to work at it, to work at you know, not causing harm in the context of that community and doing good, offering help and receiving help, even if that's hard for you to do being a person who helps to inspire others to love God more. Don't give up on it. It can be hard sometimes, but don't let it slip away. And if you don't have this kind of community, my encouragement is that you keep looking for it. Keep searching because it's worth it. It's so important for, for us. I can't emphasize how significant it is to have this kind of precious experience of a, being with and walking with a group of people who together are pursuing God and seeking to stay in love with Him. Trust me, it's worth it. And that brings us to our final discussion question. When was a time when being a part of a community helped you to stay in love with God? I don't need to walk slow, you've got that covered. <laughs> A small book. That's not right. Mm -hmm. went, <laughs> I can say it. <laughs> Hello, my name's Kevin Fitton, and I am the worship leader for Sycamore Creek's Potterville campus. And, uh, <laughs> and also, <laughs> this is such a different skill from just preaching. Oh, jeez. This feels so... <laughs> Wendy. <laughs>